record this session, so it will be recorded and um, sent out later on. But my name is James Romelli, and we're here today to talk about swing trading uh, options based on unusual options activity. Who here has never heard of unusual options activity before? Is hearing me say that term and is very unfamiliar with it, has never heard it used before either on CNBC, Fox Business, Bloomberg, read about it online, had a friend tell them. Well, I'd be pretty surprised if none of you have ever heard of a, or if any of you have never heard of unusual options activity, because it's something that's become quite prominent over the past couple of years here, as we've had an increasing number of insider trading cases revolving around equity options traders using insider information to trade ahead of merger and acquisition deals, drug announcements, or any other type of large catalyst event that is non-publicly known, right? So we're going to talk about those types of trades, meaning the types of unusual option activity trades that are being done by those that have insider information. And then we're also going to talk about why even if an institutional trader does not have insider information, why we still care about their order flow and why I still want to see where they are putting their money and where they are betting in the equity options market. So before we get started, <clears throat> I do want to read our standard boilerplate risk disclaimer. Day trading, short-term trading, options trading, and future trading are extremely risky undertakings. They generally are not appropriate for someone with limited capital, little or no trading experience, and or low tolerance for risk. Never execute a trade unless you can't afford to and are prepared to lose your entire investment. All trading operations involve serious risks, and you can lose your entire investment. No trades are recommendations or advice, and we cannot be sued for losses of capital. All trades are for educational purposes only. Contact your broker or registered investment advisor for all execution, margin, and other capital requirement questions. Everyone watching the presentation adheres to all disclaimers on OptionHacker.com and KeenOnTheMarket.com. Now, before we get started with the actual presentation here, I want to introduce myself. My name is James Romelli. I'm a trader and moderator here at KeenOnTheMarket.com. I'm also our head options educator. I actively trade futures, forex, stocks, commodities, and equity options, but my main bread and butter is definitely equity options. 98% of all my trades are in equity options markets, with the other 1.9% probably being in the underlying stocks that trade in those markets but i'm regularly on um cnbc bloomberg fox business and being in canada if you haven't seen me on tv it's a chance you may have read something i've written in the past i read for futures magazine active trader magazine resource investor magazine and cme open markets magazine so let's talk a little bit first here about the philosophy behind this trading plan now it's a sad statistic, but a very true statistic that the vast, vast majority of active retail traders lose money. They can't seem to become profitable in a consistent manner, but that isn't the case for institutional investors. So you have to ask yourself the question, what is it about retail traders that makes it so difficult for them to be successful at the game? Well, one of the things is that retail traders generally tend to trade very emotionally, right? Because one, they're trading their own money. Two, they're the ones who are making all of the decisions. There's not really any help being given to you when you're trading your own account. But it's against human nature to uh, kind of disbelieve your first instinct, even if you are you know, continually proven wrong. So if I buy a stock for $100 and I see it go down to $90, my brain wants to tell me, hey, you liked it at $100. It's fantastic at $90. Hey, you liked it at 100, it's even better at 80, and I can continue to keep adding. And so it's kind of counterintuitive, a way that I need to think to be successful as a trader. And emotions is a really big part of that game, even to the point where Paul Tudor Jones, and if any of you have never heard of Paul Tudor Jones, he's one of the most successful traders in the entire world, extremely successful hedge fund manager worth about $5 billion. He's got a lot more money than I do and an incredibly talented trader. But he will even say that the key to trading success is emotional discipline. Remember that even if I have a really good trading plan that I think gives me a lot of edge in the market, if I am emotional and I react in such a way when trades go against me that I stop following my plan, even if it's the best plan in the world, it's not going to work unless I follow it. But is that really all there is for Paul Tudor Jones? Is that the only reason that he is successful or as successful as he is? Well, obviously you know the emotional discipline probably played a really big role in him getting to where he is today but as he continues to be successful in markets is it just that he is the most emotionally in control trader on wall street is that really all that there is to his success or is there something else we want to talk about institutional edge and institutional edge is mainly derived from this capital they have so much more 
capital than a retail trader. Now, this capital gives them access on a higher level to all three of these other things that I really can't get access to, right? Information, the more capital that an institution has, the higher quality information that they can get. They just have better access, right? I can get as much information as I can on the internet, but I can't pay for uh, Bloomberg terminals. And even more so than that, I can't afford the technology that they can to do analysis of that information, okay? I can get as much price data, historical price data, charts, financials, as much of that as I want. But I don't have the systems in place to do the same level of analysis that the institutional trader can you know, of that information. And the main thing that they have in their favor when it comes to this information is the manpower to do much more analysis than I can. Now, how many of you here spend time outside of market hours during the week doing research, looking at charts, reading financials, reading articles, watching news, um, you know, uh, lo looking at old trades, looking at your trading plan, doing some type of work outside of market hours to make yourself a better trader. Good. I would imagine that most of you that are in here do because this the fact that you are in here means that you spend time outside of market hours trying to learn more and become a better trader, right? How many hours a week would you guys say you spend doing that? How many hours a week? Just curiously. Ballpark number. Just just shout out a number. I'm just I'm just curious. 12 hours, 50? Wow, that is a lot. 40 hours, two or three, one or two. Right. We you know, everyone has a different schedule. Most retail traders aren't trading full time. Perhaps those of you that are trading full time can spend a little bit more time. Perhaps some of you have responsibilities outside of trading. You can't spend 50 hours a week going over charts, doing research. But even if you can spend 50 hours a week, which is really impressive, by the way, I, I definitely don't spend anything close to that doing research. And we're going to talk about why I don't need to, actually, as we go through this, which is very interesting. But even if I do spend 50 hours a week outside of market hours looking at charts, reading articles, learning about the market, doing as much as I can to get more information, I'm never going to be able to do as much work as a desk of 12 quants with PhDs in mathematics and engineering are going to be able to do. Right. There's just no way I can't do it. And I don't have the capital to pay a team of people to do analysis of all of this information that I have access to. I'm only one guy. I'm one person and I can only do so much work in a week. So that's a major, major edge that institutional traders have over me is that they have massive teams of people that are able to do work for them and go over all of this information and anal uh, analyze it and put it into a plan that then spits out a strategy that they want to trade, okay? So what we want to talk about is what happens after all of this analysis and work uh, is done, we get to unusual options activity. So unusual options activity is driven by institutional order flow. So an unusual options activity order is any order in the equity options market that is above the average daily volume in a given stock. These types of orders give me insight into what institutions are doing and where they are putting their risk capital. It also lets me see where smart money or big money is going. Okay, now this works particularly well with equity options for a couple of different reasons that we will get to on uh, the following slides here. But in equity options, unlike most other markets, it's much more difficult for institutional traders to hide their order flow from the rest of us, meaning that they can't really hide what it is that they're doing. They can't really hide their intentions because equity options are much more transparent of a market than the stock market is. And we're going to talk about that as well. But Essentially, we're looking for the four main types of trades that institutions make, and it seems pretty obvious, but there are four different things that we can see hitting the tape, and obviously there's all different kinds of spreads and other advanced strategies, but essentially what we're looking for are the outright option plays like this, because they tend to be the easiest to read. So a trader can buy calls, sell calls, buy puts, or sell puts, and institutions can do these in very large size. Someone says, do you use Thinkorswim to find this activity? Um, I can. Thinkorswim has a, a sizzle index. They also have a, a news alert feed. Uh, we use a service called Trade Alert. We also offer a, um, a service called Option Hacker that does this, but there's a lot of different places online to find this. 
even from financial media outlets, they they do write about unusual options activity. But there are two main participants in the equity options market, right? Hedgers and speculators. Hedgers come in and buy or sell equity options to protect themselves against adverse moves in the underlying position. They have some type of position in the underlying. They're trading the options around it to protect themselves against some type of bad thing happening to them. Speculators come into the equity options market to bet on the direction of the underlying stock, direct, bet on the directions of implied volatility, bet on the passage of time via time decay. But every single type of trade that hits the tape, regardless of what it is, whether it's outright calls, outright puts, calls being sold, puts being sold, spreads trading, any trade that hits the tape can be a trade that is being executed by either a hedger or a speculator. So a big goal in trading unusual options activity is determining exactly what the trader's underlying motivation is and whether or not they are a speculative trader or they are coming in and using equity options to hedge their bets. So as a retail trader looking at this order flow, it's really important for me to determine what it is I think that they are doing, whether they are hedging or speculating. What do you guys think is the more significant order flow. The order flow from the hedgers or the order flow from the speculators? If you had to guess, knowing nothing about unusual options activity or nothing else about um, equity options, what order flow is more significant, the hedgers or the speculators? <clears throat> so a couple of people saying hedgers, a couple of people saying speculators, but it is the speculators. And why is that? Because it's a lot easier to glean information off the speculative order flow than it is to glean information off of the hedgers. If I am a hedger coming into the equity options market and I'm buying an enormous block of calls against short stock, I'm doing, the ho doing that hoping that those calls go to zero hoping that those calls go to zero. I hope I lose money on those calls because it means that my overall position is going well. I'm successful in my overall position. So I want to focus on the speculative order flow. I don't want to be trading any hedges. If the whole point of following this plan is to trade like the institution, I want to trade like the speculative institutional trader, not the hedger. Okay. So to understand why we care so much about unusual options activity, it's important to understand the order process and how this works. Because to understand why we care and why options are the best place to look for this type of activity, it's important to understand why um, options markets are more transparent. So like we said, the research information and analysis that – ooh, that was a terrible, terrible line. I'm sorry. It's late. Um, so the research information and analysis that hedge funds do is typically going to be at a higher level of anything that I'd be able to do on my own, simply because I don't have the time or resources to do everything that they do. So they come up with a trade idea, and a lot of time and money goes into that research and information analysis, and they say, okay, now we have our trade. We want to buy X, Y, Z, oh, well, X, Y, Z calls. Let's get it done. So they will call up their broker and say, we want to buy 10,000 out of the money calls in stock XYZ for 50 cents. The broker will then shop that order around to trading desks all over the place. Citadel, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Barclays, Citigroup. Um, what have you, right? It doesn't work like it, it does when you and I want to trade something, right? Because their orders are such size, they need to be shopped around. Someone, you know, of, of large size on the other end of that needs to take the trade, right? It's not just something that they can, you know, type into their Thinkorswim platform and hope to have filled. But their broker, if they can't get the order filled by a market maker at a trading desk somewhere, then they will go to the trading pit and market makers in the pit can trade it. If no one in the pit wants to trade it, then the broker might choose to execute the trade for their customer themselves and hedge it and deal with the risk, you know, deal with the risk there on their own, right? Just in the interest of uh, keeping good business with the customer. But what's really important to understand is that at no point throughout this process do they have the option to send the order flow off of the exchange somewhere. So no matter where across this chain that order is executed, it is executed somewhere on a, a public exchange, the SIBO, the Philex, the BSX, whatever. It doesn't really matter. There's a dozen different exchanges. It's got to go through one of them. It has to go through one of them. So what does that mean? 
that means that they can't hide their order flow like equities traders can. Institutional equities traders, they trade on the open market, they trade on the NICE, they trade on the BATS, they trade on electronic markets that we can see, but most of the volume that they trade happens somewhere where we'll never be able to see it. Most of it goes through dark pools, right? <clears throat> Citadel has their office down the street here from us in Chicago, and by the time the first hour of trading has rolled by in the trading day, they've already traded more stock than the NYSE will trade all day long, okay? That means that using this type of uh, idea of looking for large bets in equities doesn't work, but it does work in equity options because they cannot hide the order flow, okay? So does everyone follow along so far, making sense to everybody so far? So that means that all of the institutional equity options order flow is available for me to see. I'm going to be able to see it. They can't hide it from me. So what does it look like? This is a, a little snippet of an alert from one of our uh, uh, the service that we use called Trade Alert. Many other services online will have this formatted in a different way, but <clears throat> what is available from the exchange is all of the relevant information about an order that comes across the tape. We can see the time it traded at, whether it was bought or sold, the size of the trade, the symbol, the expiration, the strike price, whether it was a call or a put, the price that it traded at, the market at the time of the trade, whether it was an opening or closing position, and the um, price of the stock at the time of the trade. Okay, so what we see here, there's a lot of different information. For one, we see the size of the trade, 9,000 contracts. We can also see that it took place shortly after the open. 9.42, 12 minutes after the open. That's Eastern time. Here we are in Chicago or in Central time, but this is 12 minutes after the open in New York. They paid 35 cents for 9,000 of these puts when the market was 30 at 35. So what does that tell me? That tells me that they came in, looked at the market, 30 bid at 35 cents, and said, you know what? We're just going to pay 35 cents. We're not going to bid 30. We want these contracts. We are not going to work an order. We are getting into this. OK, this is a more aggressive trade. All right. It tells me that this trader is being more aggressive and that I want to pay attention to this. because This is a large bet, right? Nine thousand contracts is a large, large order. There's not too many traders in the world who are sitting in their basement as retail traders in their pajamas with their laptop trading in this type of size. OK, so this is a <clears throat> so this is a. Um, example of what this information looks like when it comes across the tape all right so what do I do with this information once I see it I have to determine whether or not this is an actionable trading idea right are they coming in and putting this on as a hedge are they coming in and putting this on to speculate on further downside in Michael Kors or are they closing this position now this is easy one because I can tell right away that it's opening because it's labeled opening now, not every single trade is going to be labeled opening like this, okay? Not every trade is going to be labeled opening, but I'm going to teach you guys how to know for sure whether or not a trade is opening or closing based on uh, just the volume and open interest in the trade. We're going to go over that when we get into the actual trading plan. Okay, so let's take a look here at what happened in this particular scenario. Well, this trade hit the tape shortly after the open on May 27th. KORS had reported earnings and gapped lower on the open. So this is a $315,000 bearish bet being made by this trader. And when we came in and saw this bet being made early that morning, the stock was already getting crushed on earnings, right? It was getting absolutely smoked. So the stock continued to sell off after this very large order hit the tape and these puts ripped higher. Let's look at how this order traded or the stock traded after this order hit. So this is the bar that these puts were bought in right here. An institutional trader came in and got very short in this bar right here. And what happened? We continue to uh, lower, make new lows. We stagnate for a while in the, uh, in the uh, you know, early afternoon, late morning, and then make new lows into the close. Obviously, these puts gained significantly in value after that move happened in KORS. So a stock, the stock moved to session lows, the puts exploded in value, and traded as high as $1.36 on the 527 session. So on that June or on that May 27th session, they traded as high as 136. So over the course of just that day, these puts nearly quadrupled in value. 
they nearly quadrupled in value just over the course of that day. So this trader was able to profit over $900,000 when these puts were at session highs. If a trader would have bought a 20 lot of these puts, they would have profited $2,020 at the highs on $700 worth of risk. All right. Now, this $700 in risk is only the amount of risk that this trader that I would have had to put on here if I was willing to let these options go to zero. Okay. So even willing, you know, even letting. I'm sorry about that, guys. I think I bumped my uh, microphone there and uh, accidentally muted it there. I'm not so sure when uh, when I cut out. So what I was saying there was um, that $700 in risk is only the level of risk that I have if I'm willing to let these options go to zero. Now, these 20 puts that I would have bought, if they went to zero, I'd lose $700. But I don't have to risk every single penny of that premium. I don't have to if I don't want to. I'm going to show you guys how to determine uh, a little bit later on how to determine what I want to do or what to do, you know, in terms of uh, stop losses and uh, lowering the amount of risk that I can have on in an individual position, um, depending on what type of trader I am and what my skill level is. I can use different types of stop losses to lower the amount of overall risk up, um, in the position. Okay. So. I can obviously see here that by following institutional order flow, I can get into some really huge trades. Now, is this an example of, the, of an institutional trader coming in and putting on a bet when they had some type of insider information? No. This is them coming in and saying, hey, you know what? Based on our expert analysis, we believe that the momentum to the downside in KORS has not yet run its course. So we want to get short and continue to play that momentum to the downside. What is an example of UOA ahead of some type of M&A deal where there may have been some type of insider information. Take a look at this example in Kraft. On March 10th, a trader bought 10,000 of the Kraft June 67 half calls for 70 cents. About three weeks later or so, the announcement was made that Kraft and Heinz were going to merge, become one of the largest food companies in the entire world, and that Kraft was going to pay a monster, humongous dividend, all right? And the stock gapped higher here, and these puts went from $0.70 cents to $22.70, meaning that on a 20 lot, I could have made $44,000, okay? Now, let me ask you guys this, and you know, without any knowledge of uh, the, you know, general dynamics of unusual option activity, do you guys think that this trader who put this 10,000 lot of calls on back in March, do you think that he just got lucky or do you think that he knew that this was going to happen? Did he make this $700,000 bet and just get lucky or did he know that this was going to happen? He knew. We never will know. Unless, of course, we uh, see someone being uh, let out of an office somewhere in handcuffs in relation to the KRFT insider trading case someday. We'll never know for sure what type of information this person had when they put this trade on. We never will. But it really doesn't matter because I know that even if they didn't have insider information, that the amount of time that went into this order and the amount of capital that went into this order makes it interesting nonetheless. OK, but when they have insider information and they do this, they are breaking the law An inside an insider, you know, when they actually become an insider trader. It doesn't really they haven't really broken the law until they make the trade. Right. So once they make the trade, they've broken the law. But if I can recognize what that suspicious type of order flow looks like, I can trade along with this trader in this same position without any worries of getting in trouble for insider trading because I'm using public information via his order flow to make my decision. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? Now you might say, okay, this doesn't seem typical. I mean, how often could this possibly happen? This is obviously an enormous, enormous winning trade. 
it happens a lot more often than you think. That's that would be my answer to that question. It happens a lot more often than you would think. A study was published sometime oh, about 18 months to two years ago that said ahead of merger and acquisition deals, about 25 percent of those deals of the stocks involved in those deals have some type of telegraphing or leading unusual option activity going into the deal. OK, so what does that mean? That means that 25 percent of the time. Out of one out of every four merger and acquisition deals has someone coming in and using insider information to trade. Does anyone out there think that that statistic is overstated or understated? What do you guys think? Do you think that they that there's there's less of that going on than the study claims, or much more? What do you guys think? Just say less or more. Is there more insert more insider trading than that going on, or less? I, for one, believe that there's quite a bit more going on than that. I see uh, things happen literally every day that are incredibly suspicious in the equity options market ahead of big news events. One fantastic example of this, of this idea happened just recently in a stock called HUM, Humana. So let's take a look at HUM real quick. This is a fantastic example of the exact same thing that I'm trying to illustrate here. So let me erase my drawings real quick. So take a look at the chart here in HUM. We see that on a Friday, not too long ago, there was an enormous move higher in HUM. Now, would you guys believe that before the stock was halted and reopened and ripped $30, and I'm I'm talking right before, moments before, a trader came in and made a $17,000 bet that by the end of the day was worth $3.5 million. And he made that bet in options that expired that exact same day. Now, with that knowledge, do you guys think that that trader got lucky, or do you think that he knew what was going to happen and that HUM was going to announce that they were going to be putting themselves up for sale. He knew. He knew. Obviously, he knew. Right? So why do insiders choose to use the equity options market to commit <laughs> insider trading? Well, for one, they're able to make a lot more money in the equity options market than they would be buying, uh, able to do when buying the stock. This trader made something like, what, $22 million in craft. You know, they never would have been able to do that in the stock unless they had a ton of capital. You know, tens and tens of millions of dollars in capital, and they would not have been able to do this. They use options because, one, they're able to make more money, and two, it's a little bit easier for them to kind of get lost in the fold, right? Not that many insider trading cases get tried that are from the options market they're not quite as good at catching it right but even if they were it doesn't really matter to me the hedge funds and big traders have more information than us that's really the point that i kind of want to drive home here is that that information isn't necessarily insider information it isn't necessarily information that was obtained illegally or it's not information that's being used illegally a lot of hedge funds are or most hedge funds the vast majority of hedge funds i believe are run by very honest people who would never even dream of committing securities fraud or insider trading. But there's a lot of those out there who will. It doesn't really matter because I care about the order flow from both of them. I care about the order flow from the honest hedge fund trader, and I care about the order flow from the dishonest hedge fund trader as well, right? Because it's like being able to look at what Carl Icahn or David Einhorn, Bill Ackman are doing in their positions via the equity options market. And then it's also like looking at the order flow of the guy who plays golf with the with a vice president from Kraft who just so happened to mention that, hey, maybe there's going to be some type of deal coming soon, right? All of the order flow is relevant. Hedge funders get in trouble for insider information and insider trading, but all of the people that follow their order flow will never, ever, ever get in trouble because they haven't done anything wrong. And there's been many examples of, you know, traders that follow a suspicious options activity, got rich, and the person who initiated that activity goes to jail, but the people who follow do not because they have not done anything wrong. Anytime an equity options trade is placed, 
that order flow becomes public information and I can use that information to do with as I please. I can make any trading decision I want based off of that information. Okay? So we all following along so far. Does anyone have any questions right now? Does anyone have any questions? Otherwise, we're going to jump right into the trading plan now. So we went over here, how to identify unusual options activity, um, you know, what it looks like and what it is. So now we're going to talk about, okay, now that I've done that, how do I actually turn that into an actionable trading idea that I can initiate as a retail trader? So the first thing that you have to ask yourself is what type of trader are you? Are you a day trader? Are you a swing trader? Are you a scalper? Are you someone who likes to trade um, option strategies for a credit to collect premium? Are you someone who likes to be long options? Are you someone who likes to be short options? What type of trades are you most comfortable with? Because what's really great about unusual options activity is that hedge funds do them all. They do every single type of strategy that you can imagine. There's hedge funds out there that are going to bet where Apple is trading in an hour. They're going to bet on where Apple's trading in two years. So as a retail trader, all I need to do is pay attention to the order flow that is most relevant to me. So if I'm someone who likes to trade weekly options or I'm someone who likes to day trade very short dated options, all I have to do is pay attention to all of the order flow in shorter dated options and weekly options because that's where the smart money is betting for that type of strategy. If I'm someone who likes to do swing trades three to six months out, well, hey, all I have to do is pay attention to the order flow that's three to six months out. All right, all I have to do is, and someone says, I, I consider myself all of the above. That's great. That's fantastic. Soros just bought major shares in uh, PTBI. Yeah. So any type of strategy can be found by following unusual option activity, right? Because hedge funds do it all. And I'm going to be able to focus on the order flow that is most relevant to me. Okay, so I consider myself a very active, very nimble trader. My office is right across the street from the CBOE and the uh, CME, and I am in front of the screen all day long. I sit here in my office behind my computer. I have eight monitors. I'm able to watch a lot of stuff. I am constantly trading and paying attention to the order flow. So I want to be as nimble and quick as possible. I might hold the trades for a matter of minutes before exiting, maybe a matter of hours, maybe a matter of days, maybe a matter of weeks, but not everyone can trade that way. It's difficult to do that when you have other responsibilities, when you have a, another job, when you're not in front of the screen all day long. It can be very stressful as well to worry about very short dated positions when you can't give them your full uh, undivided attention, okay? And I always say that if you're the type of trader that is trading in a way that makes you feel stressed out or keeps you up at night, then you're doing it wrong. You should never be in that type of situation. So unusual option activity is great because it gives me the opportunity to trade any way that I want. So I tend to stay nimble, but there's a lot of really great trades that I pass on because I don't want a holding period that is too long. I want to stay as nimble as I possibly can, and I want to have as much, you know, quote unquote, dry powder as I can. Some traders prefer swing trades. Some traders prefer longer dated options. But that's okay. You can still use unusual options activity. You just have to make the same analysis that I would in my shorter dated positions. And the analysis method that we use, we call the Oak Ribbit Trading Plan. And it's an acronym. It's not the uh, most uh, eloquent of acronyms, but we haven't thought of anything better over the past uh, several years here. If you guys have any suggestions, feel free to uh, send them to me in an email. But on February 27th, a trader bought 150,000 GE Jan 2017 3035 bull call spreads for 52 cents. Okay, right away, I know this is an institutional order. So I'm going to use the Oak Ribbit trading plan to analyze the order and determine if it was an opening or closing position. Um, whether or not it's a hedge or a speculative bet, the risk, reward, and break even of the trade, and my time and target period for the trade as well. If I like the way that all of those things set up, then I'll take the trade. If I don't, I don't have to take the trade. That's the other good thing about unusual options activity is that, you know what, the hedge funds aren't going to stop trading. That's their job. That's what they do. It's how they make money. So if I don't like a trade setup, I can pass on it and just wait for the next one. I can wait for them to come in and do something again. Okay? So this was a $7.8 million bet. So I automatically know right away that this is 
<clears throat> institutional order flow. Why do I know that? Because most retail traders do not have $8 million to bet in the derivatives market on GE, okay? So I automatically know <clears throat> that it is, is a uh, institutional order. So then I need to determine whether or not it's an opening or closing position. I definitely don't want to be buying these as this trader is selling 150,000 of them or getting out of the position. So I see these bought and I need to determine whether or not it was opening or whether or not they were closing these. And I do that with open interest. That's the O in the Oak Ribbit trading plan. Volume needs to be greater than open interest. If volume is greater than open interest, volume, then I know it is an opening position. Why is that? Think about this logically. If there is 5,000 contracts in open interest on the XYZ 100 strike calls, and I see an order for a sell of 10,000 of those calls, I know that it is an opening sell. Why do I know that? Because there isn't 10,000 contracts in open interest for them to close. They have to be new initiating sellers. Okay, so this order came across at volume way, way, way over open interest. Okay, so if volume is greater than open interest, I know that it's opening. If it's not, then I am not able to determine with 100% accuracy if the trade is opening or closing. Whenever I that is the case, I usually will pass on the trade because I want to trade opening orders only and I want to see huge volume over open interest because it shows me how much more conviction that trader has in that trade. The interest, open interest is small. They don't care. They're going to come in and put on 150,000 call spreads and they don't care who notices. Okay. Next, I need to determine whether or not the order was a speculative bet or a hedge, and I'm going to use the chart to do this. Now, I'm not a huge technical analysis guy. I never really have been. I think that there's uh, you know, some very valid arguments to be made uh, as to why technical analysis is incredibly useful, and I know a lot of traders out there who only believe in technical analysis, but I think that it has its role in this trading plan in helping me determine whether or not an order is a hedge or a speculative bet. So typically speaking, institutional traders are not coming in and betting against the market. What do I mean by that? I mean that they don't come in and try to get short a stock that is making new 52-week highs. They don't come in and try to get long a stock that's making new 52-week lows. They try to bet with those trends. So if I can determine the strength of the trend in either direction, then I can determine whether or not an order is likely to be a speculative bet or a hedge. Let's say this. I have a stock, stock XYZ, that in today's session made a brand new 52-week high. <clears throat> right into the close of today's trading, I saw 10,000 out of the money puts bought in that name as an opening position. Do you guys think that that trader that bought those is speculating that stock XYZ will be moving lower, or is that trader coming in and hedging an existing position? Most likely, they're coming in and hedging an existing position. If the stock is making new 52-week highs, they're probably hedging. Just like if I see calls being bought in stocks making new 52-week lows, it's more likely that that's a trader hedging their short stock position. They don't try to pick bottoms. They don't try to call tops. So whether or not you consider yourselves you know, good technical analysis traders doesn't really matter because the method that we use for evaluating the chart with this plan is incredibly simple and very, very easy to use. It's called the Ichimoku cloud. Has anyone never seen this before on a chart? Has anyone never seen this before? The shaded area that we have here is known as the Ichimoku cloud. And it is a set of forward-looking moving averages, and I can <clears throat> I can talk about this for the next three hours if you guys like. But simply put, and if you take one thing away from this presentation, please make it this one point. Anything that's below this shaded area up here is in bearish territory. Anything above it is in bullish territory. Anything inside it is neutral. So as I come in and I see that on the day that these call spreads were bought, GE is above the cloud – and that it has been ripping higher since earnings back here, I can pretty much determine that this is not a trade that is being put on by a trader who is buying call spreads and shorting stock. They believe that the stock is going higher. They believe the stock is going higher. 
Okay, that's why they're coming in and do this. Also, the, the you know the expiration kind of helps me make that determination as well. It's not too common for a trader to come in, go all the way out to January of 2017 to short stock and then get long call spreads to protect himself so he can be short GE for the next two years. Okay, that's not really how this type of trading goes down. That's not really how hedge funds trade equity options. Okay, so. I can see that we're in a bullish territory on the daily chart. I can see that we're breaking the cloud to the upside here. And I can see that that sets me up for a great swing trade opportunity on the breakout. So what is the next step here? Now that I know that it's speculative order, I need to determine if the risk reward and break even line up with my trading plan. Now, this is a call spread, so I cannot lose more money than the price of the spread. So if I pay 52 cents for this call spread, I cannot lose more than 52 cents, meaning that my risk is $52 per one lot. So then I can measure that risk as one of two ways, as a percentage of my book or as a total dollar amount. So let's say that I tell myself I don't want to risk more than 5% of my book in any given trade. I think that 5%, 5 to 10% of, of total book in these longer dated trades like this is totally acceptable, perfectly fine. And this one is traded pretty cheap at 52 cents, so I can scale it up pretty easily. This also tells you that you know you don't have to have a account with a half a million dollars in it to trade these strategies. I can trade these strategies <clears throat> and um, you know use any account size to do so. One of those call spreads costs 52 bucks, right? So even if you have five grand in your account, you can do this type of trading. So when I enter the trade, I then need to determine whether or not I want to use a stop loss. Now we tend to say that the more experienced you are, the wider your stop loss can be. Why is that? Well, <clears throat> as a beginner who's just starting to trade this way and just starting to learn how to use these types of strategies, you're not going to be an expert or quite as good at identifying these trades as you know, opening or closing, speculative bets or hedges, or as actionable ideas. So you don't want to risk too much in each position. As you get better and better at doing that, you can kind of scale up your risk. I, whenever I get uh, into a trade, I never use a stop. I never use a stop because I have been doing this for quite some time and I'm able to identify and, you know, call these trades out a little bit better. And I can also determine whether or not I want to add to positions based on a pullback or anything like that, okay? So once I make that determination, I then need to make sure that I am sticking to the same time and target as the institutional trader. So I wanna trade the exact same expiration as the trader, and I want to get out of the position if I see the calls being sold. I wanna put my offers out right away in the position and make sure I am getting a good potential reward for the risk that I am taking on. So watch how the stock moved after the order hit. It ripped higher on the news that they were gonna spin off the GE Capital Division, and the spread traded as high as $1.04 and is currently trading around 80 cents, meaning it's over 50% profits in just a few short months. This spread is also much less exposed to time decay as well. Okay, guys? So we're gonna let me show you the chart on the next slide here. Oh, actually, give me give me one sec give me one second here, guys. Don't don't go anywhere. I'll give me give me just one second to uh to fix something here. Hold on, hold tight for just a second. Uh, sorry about that, guys. My uh, <laughs> contact lens fell out and I couldn't see the screen anymore. So take a look at what happened here. They make the announcement that they're going to spin off GE Capital. The stock gaps higher and this spread doubles in value from the level that this trader put the spread on at. Okay. 
huge, huge, huge move higher and 100% profits in what was not that risky of a trade to begin with. Okay, so this trader came in and put these on, you know, sometime back here, Feb 27, the stock sold off a little bit, languished before gapping higher on news. What do you think happened in this position? Was this a trader that just got lucky or was this a trader that knew? Was this a trader that just got lucky or did this trader know? What do you guys think? I think that this is a little bit of a combination of both. I don't necessarily think that this trader knew for sure that this deal was going to happen because if they knew for sure, they probably wouldn't have bought the Jan 2017 options. They probably would have bought something a little bit more shorter dated and a little bit cheaper, giving them even more upside. I think that this is a combination of what is maybe not quite uh, – you know, um, entirely public information, so you maybe slightly non-public information, and a good look at these things. So, like, I think that this trader knew or, or had an idea or had heard rumor that there was going to be a deal in GE of some kind. He just didn't know when or exactly what, but that something was brewing in GE, that there was going to be an announcement made. So he just went out and said, all right, you know what I'm going to do then? I'm going to risk a little bit of money between now and the end of the end of January of 2017. If a deal happens any time between now and then, I get paid. If it doesn't, then I was wrong, and I've only lost 52 cents over the course of the next two years, right? That's what, how I read this trade. But either way, you know, a brilliant, brilliant setup here that worked out really, really well. And identifying this led to some huge, huge profits. Now, in addition to that giant call spread that traded in GE, over the course of these three days here, there was a lot of other activity that was shorter dated. Now, I made um, – uh, this is Trading View. This is completely free. You can go to tradingview.com and uh, look at charts just like this. Now, I traded shorter dated options in this because I wanted to stay more nimble, and I got I definitely got paid when this happened. Trust me, I made plenty of money in this position, but I took a lot of pain as this little move went lower here. I was staring at this thing, pounding my head against the wall every day, and then finally the move happened. Anyone who took the spread did not have that type of situation. They didn't really see that much of a move in their position at all. Right, So that type of position can be put on, and if you're someone who doesn't really like to trade options or thinks they're too risky, no, that's that's completely not accurate. This trade could have been held even through the little move lower after it was initiated with almost no pain taking there in, um, uh, in, that, uh, in that trade. So like I said, you can tailor this to any type of trading plan that you want. All right, so all you need to do is look for this order flow and then follow it, and you'll be trading on the same side as these big institutions and as insiders, to be honest, right, and as, as the insiders, right? We see this happen all of the time, all right? And even if you're not an options trader, maybe you're someone who doesn't really have experience with options or you're someone who uh, is intimidated by options because of the leverage, well, for one, I don't think that you should be, and but two – you can use unusual options activity as a guide to trading stock as well, right? I can say, all right, someone's coming in and getting massively long bullish options positions. Maybe I want to consider a swing trade in this stock. So if you're a swing trader who trades stocks, this is still very valuable information for you. Because remember what I told you at the beginning of the presentation, if you're an equities trader, you're never going to be able to find the institutional order flow. It's just not possible. You're never going to be able to find it. So as an equities trader, why would you not care about unusual options activity, because that's the window. That's your window into what institutions are doing, okay? So does anyone have any questions? Any more questions here? Um, I want to – I have uh, – we've got about 10 minutes left here. I have plenty of time to take questions. Uh, but before we do, I do want to give you guys a chance to sign up for our un long-term swing trading unusual options activity workshop that we're going to be hosting live on June 25th at 8 p.m. Eastern time. We're going to only offer 25 spots to this group of – uh, registrants here. It's regularly priced at $497, but we are going to offer it at a very significant discount here. We're going to talk about how to swing trade options positions with holding periods between six months and one year, how to trade short-term bottoms or tops in stocks with less risk, how to avoid losing money in options via time decay, 
how to use an A to Z trading plan for swing trading these positions. We went over the Oak River trading plan here, so you can probably step away from this presentation and at least uh, you know, go through and identify what orders are interesting or actionable. But what we're going to go through is an A to Z trading plan, meaning that there's not going to be any question marks in any situation. And every time you see an order coming across, you're going to be able to evaluate it, determine if it is actionable, know what your entry is, know where your stop loss should be, and where your profit targets are in a systematic and methodical method. This is a great plan for trading momentum names like Baba, GoPro, Apple, and Facebook using UOA. And we're going to have an extensive live Q&A session. We're going to offer this for $97. It's a huge discount off of our regular price. Um, I'm going to uh, go ahead and put the link in here for you guys. Someone says, do you also use this information to trade stocks and uh, or just options or, or uh, stocks as well. I don't like to trade underlying stock just because I th think it ties up too much capital, but I use the information um, that I get from unusual options activity to place some trades in my like investment account. It's a non-trading account that I, you know, buy stocks and hold them in, but it is going to give me a window into institutional order flow. So yes, I can use it to trade stocks, and we will talk about that in the in the workshop. We will. Where do we f you find the unusual options activity? So we use a service called Trade Alert. Uh, we also have a scanner of our own called Options Hacker. Ours is definitely the cheapest one on the market. But um, there's a lot of there's a lot of other places to get that information. You can get it uh, via the Thinkorswim uh, news feed. They have these little option alert blurbs. You can get it uh, via LiveVol, which is another service. There's a couple of other scanners out there that uh, I won't mention by names because they are our competitors. But uh, a quick web search will find you a service that has it. And it's something that's written about pretty frequently on fi uh, financial media outlets. So you can find this information in a lot of different places. So do you guys have any other questions, any other questions at all about anything that we went over here? Um, the workshop will be on the 25th live at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Um, we're going to have a really long Q&A session throughout it and at the end of it. So typically these go between two and a half and three hours, but I will stay there as long as it takes for us to get through everyone's questions. So I will not leave any questions unanswered at this workshop. And what I should have mentioned at the very beginning was that we also will be offering as always, with all of the workshops that we do, a 100% money back guarantee, no questions asked. So if you come to the workshop, you sit there through the three hours long presentation, get to the end of it and say, hey, I actually did not get $97 worth of value out of this, which one, I'd be shocked if you did say that. But if you say that, we don't want your $97 and you will get a full refund, no questions asked. Now, this is something that I always make an analogy with. If I could take a trade where if the trade didn't work out for me, I could get my money back, I would do it every single time, right? Every single time, no questions asked. And that's essentially what I'm offering you guys here today. Is it possible to get this info in print? Uh, I'm not really sure what you mean. Do you mean the, the presentation that I just did? So everyone that registers for the course will get uh, a copy of this presentation and will get a copy of the recording of the workshop that we do on the 25th. So we do this workshop on the 25th. After it's over, we put together a recording. We email it out to everyone who registered, and then you get to keep that recording forever. You always have access to it, and you always have access to the PDF slides that we include as well, right? So it's like it's almost like uh, you know purchasing a, uh, a, a you know live workshop that then reverts into a textbook for you to use. Uh, and reference in the rest of your trading career, right? So you get a lot with it. <clears throat> I think I think that's uh, kind of what you're asking, yeah. So any other questions, guys? Any other questions? Any other questions? Uh, how do you use implied vol in options trading? So it's really difficult for a retail trader to trade implied volatility. Um, in this type of trading plan, um, we're not really uh, focused on implied vol. 
we're more so looking at directional trades because what we're looking for is the pure speculative bets that hedge funds are putting on betting on directions of stocks, right? Those are the easiest ones to pick out and flag as interesting or unusual, right? There's not a whole lot of uh, speculative uh, implied vol insider trading, right? It doesn't really work that way. So it's very difficult for a retail trader to do that. Um, I think that there's a lot of products out there that, uh, you know, are very cool, like Live All and some of the tools in Thinkorswim. But for the most part, I don't really use them. I mean, I, I'm aware of implied volatility and I pay attention to the, you know, general level of overall vol, uh, general levels of implied vol in the market. But, you know, trying to trade, make decisions based on changes in implied vol, very, very difficult. We can leave that to the market makers. They, they do that better than me. They do that better than everyone, so there's no reason for me to play that game. <clears throat> so any other questions here? How do you sign up for the June 25th seminar? You can go to this link right here, optionsonthefloor.com slash open to sign up. Optionsonthefloor.com slash open to sign up for the workshop. As soon as you uh, as soon as you sign up, you get a uh, things, uh, confirmation sent to you, and you can see uh, – exactly you know where, what you have to do to get to the workshop on the 25th it's going to be held live in a web room just like this very simple easy to easy to attend if you can't be there on the 25th you can't be there for the whole thing on the 25th don't worry it is recorded and it will be sent out to you so any other questions guys any other questions i have a question is the have the hawks scored yet <laughs> i live in chicago and uh <laughs> As much as I love to talk about unusual options activity, I am missing the hockey game right now <laughs> to do so. But you guys are great, so that's fine. You guys are great, so that's fine. <clears throat> so any other questions, guys? Any other questions? Any other questions? Any other questions? We're going to be hosting this on the 25th. We're going to go over all these different topics. If you are interested in unusual options activity, but perhaps intimidated by options markets or, you know, the kind of uh, aggressive uh, speed with which you think that these things trade, you shouldn't be. You should check out this workshop because we're going to be talking about a much more accessible way to trade unusual options activity via these swing trade positions. So any other questions, guys? Any other questions? Any other questions? Any other questions? Are there any hockey fans in here? Are there any Tampa Bay Lightning fans? <laughs> Uh, this is new to you. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 something that I think um, is becoming more and more popular because we're, you know, retail traders are starting to realize that, you know, the best way for them to get a view into institutional trading is via the options market and via following these unusual orders. And we're seeing some pretty insane things happen in the equity options market. I mean, I, that craft trade is probably one of the largest ones I've ever seen. Trade me like $22 million. <clears throat> Uh, Option Hacker does not have a free trial, unfortunately. We would love to offer one, but the way that uh, end-user license agreements work for uh, Opera Data, which is equity options data, we cannot offer free trials, unfortunately. Which is also why when you sign up for a paper trading account uh, through any broker, you have 20-minute delayed data because they can't offer real-time data for free. So any other questions, guys? Any other questions? Any other questions? Optionsonthefloor.com slash open to get this course. It's going to be a great one. We're um, pretty excited about it. It's going to be a very comprehensive look at this. Trying to give me the score. I, I just checked. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's scoreless right now. They're almost they're almost through the first period. <laughs> There's only 50 seconds left in the first period. <laughs> I actually went I went to the game I went to game three uh, on on uh, Monday I was there and they lost 
and it was very upsetting. <laughs> it was very upsetting to be uh, to see that many people disappointed in one place, <laughs> me including myself. <laughs> that too. <laughs> So any other questions, guys? Any other questions? If not, we're pretty much at the end here. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording for now, just in the interest of having a uh, nice short hour-long recording. So thank you guys for coming. Everyone have a fantastic evening. Be sure to check out optionsonthefloor.com slash open to sign up for um, this workshop that we'll be hosting live on June 25th at 8 p.m. Eastern time. We're only offering 25 spots at this price, so please, please, please take advantage of it now. If you were interested in the offer, I cannot guarantee that there will be spots available for you later on this week. We're going to go over all of these topics here in an extensive live Q&A. However long it takes to answer them all, I will be there. And as always, we have a money-back guarantee, so if you're not satisfied with your purchase, you can have your money back. Everyone have a great evening, and as always, happy trading.